we will uh, go to the first question, uh, first topic on the uh, My World podcast that Jeff Jarrett brings up. And it is you and Cowboy Frankie Lane in 1979 selling out the 16,000 seat stadium, uh, I can't remember the name of the stadium, nine weeks in a row. And I've never asked you this story. It's, it's sort of your, like, one of your first claims to fame, I suppose. Well, I went to Puerto Rico because Carlos Colon, the promoter, was a friend of uh, more or less my mentor, who was Tom Ernesto, who was, I didn't know it at the time, but hell, he was like one of the greatest tag teams of all time. The Assassins. They almost wrote the book on tag team wrestling. But Carlos was starting a co company, and I didn't know he was starting a company. I mean, he'd had a company, but I thought he'd had it like 10 years or whatever. I got down there and I found out they'd only been in business for two years and hadn't, and didn't, haven't, they hadn't done that well. So I went down there in 1979. And see, January the 6th that they call Insurrection Day here, it's like Three Kings Day. Hmm. And I didn't know what Three Kings Day was, but it's like the second Christmas. So when I went down there, I'm, it's like January the 5th, and the airport in San Juan is just jammed. And I'm thinking, why in the hell are there so many people here? I didn't realize that it was, it was like Christmas for them. So we show up on January the 6th, and we go into this uh, big show, uh, holiday show, and it did, it did well. And then they, they, they decided, Carla said, well, we're going to go with you guys. So they started pushing us, me and Frankie. And I had never met Frankie before in my life. I'd heard his name, and that was it. And we were the the Cowboys or something in Spanish. Or Now, this was uh, Frankie Lane. It was this before or after he got a whack over the head from, uh, I can't remember the other this guy's was, name. This was uh, Zulu. Zulu. What it, Mighty whatever Zulu. Whatever his name was. Yeah who was a complete mental case also this was after and he and you could tell he'd had some effects from it because in his speech he would he would go to say and he he didn't talk a lot anyway but he would be talking and all of a sudden he would struggle with the word and i heard this story after even after i met frankie frankie didn't tell me somebody else told me the story but uh yeah, this was uh, after he had got hit, no, hit hit on the head. So we went in the office the first time, I think the next week, and <laughs> on the way over there, it was only like, I guess, like a five-minute cab drive away or 10, something. We go in the office, and Frankie says, you know, Dutch, that's the way he talked, you know, Dutch, they, they, they want to know what, what we're, we want to do. And I went, what we want to do. Wait a minute. We're not, don't they, don't, aren't they the bosses? Don't they, shouldn't they know what they want us to do? And we walked in and we sat down and that was the first question that Carlos asked me, what do you want to do? And I thought, I thought, I thought about it just a bit before we got to the office, but I had heard of a gimmick one time. And it was the last thing, the first thing I thought of, and the last thing I thought of is this tag team had a $1,000 challenge match to any team that they couldn't, uh, that could beat them, I guess, in a TV match. And I threw that out there somehow in some way, and Carlos, he just fell all over it. He said, oh, I love that. He said, I tell you what, we got silver dollars here. Oh, it's called the thousand dollar silver dollar challenge match. You know, you used to have silver dollars in the U.S. You can't get them anymore. Now they're um, worth a lot. They're worth more than a dollar. I'll tell you that. But and we put that on the line. Any team that we could not beat in ten minutes or less on TV, we give them a thousand dollars. And we took that and we ran it about five weeks, maybe a little more. And then we finally worked the angle and showed up on Saturday night. 17,000 people, <clears throat> just like that. We would have to get there. We got there like regular time, like 6 o'clock that day. 
We didn't make it in the dressing room to 715 because there were so many people and we had to find a place to park, couldn't find a place to park. That was the last time we made that mistake. <laughs> and then from there on for the next nine weeks or eight weeks after that, we had to get there about 430 in the afternoon and they were lined up to get in then. So for nine weeks in a row, we worked this, we worked this program and finished it out. And for nine weeks in a row, we sold out the Hiram B. Thorne Stadium. Never before done. It's never been done before. And it's never been, it, it will never be done ever now at this point. We hold that record and that can't be broken because of the nature of the business. Now, this is Carlos Colon you're facing. Uh, was it Jose Rivera? Jose Rivera was the uh, was the original partner on TV, and they beat us. And when they went to get to thousand silver dollars, oh, okay, we can't let that happen. We're heels. We're Texas no good bastards. So we attack them, get them down, beat the crap out of them. Damn near have a riot in the little TV studio with about seventy five people in there. Some little old lady threw a chair at me. She couldn't even <laughs> hardly get it up, and she threw it in trying to hit me. She was like 70 years old. So, And then they were saved by a, a, a heel. He turned babyface that day, and he was Cuban. Who was, he'd been there for years, and he, he just – the angle got hot. He got hot. We got hot. We all got hot at the same time. So when you uh, f- uh, did the stadium sell out – a row of sellouts were you against Carlos and the new heel for nine weeks yeah. straight or did was it a rotating cast of no uh, we went about we went about four weeks with with the the heel turn baby face and that's how we then that's how we transitioned back to the original guy because we beat a uh, uh, hurricane Castillo mm-hmm. the Cuban guy the new guy we beat him and we were starting to beat the crap out of Carlos and then come Jose come back in and stadium come in again. And then we went five more weeks. How did you stretch that sell out to nine weeks in a row? Were you beaten every week? Did you win every week and then lose at the no. end? How did you do it? Well, we had a few DQs in there, you know, fight out of the ring. And and the the crazy thing about it, they would put our match on fourth, which I thought was the stupidest craziest thing I'd ever heard in my life. So one day uh, I asked Carlos why he did that. And he said, well, you know, by now, and I I didn't know by then that these people like to drink. If we had waited to the end to put that match on, the people would have had a straight four hours of drinking. It would have been an uncontrollable mob. They would have killed us, literally killed us. I mean, when we would go to the ring, you know, we had dugouts. We was in a baseball stadium. I would wait, and, and this was before music. So when they rung the bell, and they would get on top of the dugout, and they would have rocks or cokes compressed around the ice. And they played baseball year round, so they had great arms, <laughs> these kids. So I would wait, and I would tell Frankie, let's wait, wait, wait. And then we, when we would leave the dugout, we would leave running. And we would run straight towards second base, not in, because then they'd have the angle on us. We would run towards second base, and we could, we could, all that stuff was hitting around us. Boom, 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 boom. I got hit a few times. That's when I invented my poncho and my big hat because a lot of times I would tuck my hat down toward them and the poncho down. Oh, they tear it up. (laughs) But it was the rocks that, that hurt. And sometimes it was more than rocks. It was bottles. It was spark plugs. They'd throw that shards of broken glass. They'd throw that. They'd throw anything they they could. (laughs) And I don't know why they couldn't stop those people getting on top of the dugout. I guess too many of them. But it was it was a very it was the most dangerous uh, or uh, the most I guess scared, afraid 
of fans that I'd ever been in my life. Because you can imagine they're out there speaking a, a different language. I didn't even know what they were saying. I knew it wasn't good. But that adds another element to it. And I'm thinking, whoa, my God, what, about, what have I gotten into? And then that's just on the way out. Hmm. Now we had to come back. And then they get on that dugout. Now we're facing them. So I have I fought back to that dugout with Carlos or Jose or Castillo almost every time <clears throat> because I would actually put them in front of me. And how can you be taking an ass whipping and moving forward? <laughs> <laughs> I was pushing the guy back. And then when I'd get close to the dugout, I'd dive in and run down the tunnel. It, it was crazy. The last match in this thing was a, 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 a barbed wire uh, match. But the, but the, the, they had a, like a, a, a group there that athletic group that controlled wrestling and they wouldn't allow it. They said it was too violent. What the hell you're in Puerto Rico. I mean, that, that's where the people live or they did then. But we didn't have it. But on, on the way to the ring, completely, we was in the Roberto Clemente, which seats another 16, 17,000. Uh, on the way to the ring, I've heard of people fighting their way uh, back from the ring. This was the first that I've heard guys fighting their way to the ring. They lined up, and, I mean, we had six or eight cops around us. And what I was worried about, because everybody has a knife there. What I was worried, it's not even hard to, you know, move a knife through a through an opening and stick you. That's what I was worried about. Mm -hmm. But we fought our way through the ring, got in the ring, and it took us about five minutes. Because now the fans are enjoying this damn big fight we got going on with some other fans down there. They didn't pay for that, but they enjoyed it anyway. And I look back at that road that I just come down and I told Frankie, I said, Frankie, you know, look, and they had all closed in with this point. I said, we just come through those people. And in about 15 minutes, something tells me we're going to have to <laughs> go back through the exact same way we came in. And it, it, it won't be pretty. And it wasn't. That was the night we matches run long there anyway. And that was the night they did put it on last because it's, they don't want to put the barbed wire up, then have to take it down, which they never actually put it up anyway. <laughs> but uh, we got out of the, of the ring back to the dressing room about 1230, which for American standards, that's, that's, you know, that's unacceptable. We can't do that. We left that building at a quarter to three in the morning and the cops were waiting. And finally the cops said, screw it guys. They said, you're on your own. We're not getting paid for these extra hours. We're gone. And they left, but the fans didn't leave. So when we left, we left, I had a, a big stick that I'd found a big club metal club and Frankie had something else. And they were still out there waiting on us about uh, 20, 30 of them. So and we lay up, I could hear the stuff hitting the car. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> but it was days like that. You wish you were baby face. Oh my God. It was, I made a lot of money. They paid, they paid well. I, I will say that. I've got a number here, but you told me yep. this. I don't know if it was in confidence, so I won't, uh, I won't say it. Uh, we, well, I bought, I, I bought my first house over that nine week run. Amazing. That's what it? I did. Amazing. Mm -hmm. 